All right, it looks like we are streaming. We're good to go, Andy. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome uh, to uh, the third day in May. Uh, I cannot believe it is May already. Um, and here we are. Um, I want to, before we get started, acknowledge that the Greater Victoria School District wishes to recognize and acknowledge the Esquimalt and Songhees nations on whose traditional territories we live, we learn, and we do our work. Um, I, I try as often as I can, and I did especially today when I was going on a, a walk around my neighborhood up here in Thetis, um, how grateful I am to be in this space. Um, and there were, there were those who were here long before I was. Um, and I think it's so important to constantly put ourselves in that space and that awareness um, to know who came uh, prior to us being here. So uh, I just value the opportunity to do that. Um, also, just a, a quick note, uh, it is our board's responsibility and particularly mine as the chair of the Ed Policy Committee to ensure that our board meetings are conducted in a safe and respectful manner. As a board of education and certainly as a committee uh, for the school district, it's important that we model the behavior that we expect of students in their schools. So I uh, just welcome everybody to reflect on that, put that into your hearts as we move forward in this really important work that we're doing. Uh, so I am your chairperson, Ryan Painter. We have as well uh, on the committee, trustee Diane McNally, trustee Nicole Duncan, uh, trustee Tom Ferris, and trustee and board chair Jordan Waters. Um, and then as well, we have joining us um, trustee Rob Painter. Um, and I don't know if, sorry, it's often managing screens is, uh, is fun. Um, I think that is, uh, oh, and trustee Elaine Leonard is here as well. Uh, so trustees Rob Painter and Elaine Leonard, uh, they are not voting members of the committee, but they are welcome to participate and engage um, in the work that the committee does. And we certainly welcome their engagement. Um, so in terms of uh, pre presentation and participating, uh, folks, uh, if you have a question um, or you want to um, um, you know, make a point, you're certainly welcome to, to ask a question. You can raise your hand using the raise hand uh, function, um, or you can submit uh, a comment in, uh, in the chat, and we can make sure uh, to catch that. Um, we'll, we'll, I will have staff uh, supporting me as we go through this, uh, um, and we'll go slowly so that we're sure to catch everybody. Uh, all right, so we will jump right into approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Moved by Trustee Ferris, thank you very much. Uh, Trustee McNally, go ahead. Thank you. Before we uh, vote on um, adopting the agenda, Chair, um, I'd like to add a motion from the floor at the will of the meeting. So I have sent it in to you and um, I believe our, our recording secretary, would you like me to read it? Uh, yeah, you can go ahead and then we'll see if the committee wants to add it uh, as an amendment to the agenda. So yes, go ahead. Okay. That the Board of Education, SD61 Greater Victoria, direct the chair to write to Minister of Education, Jennifer Whiteside uh, on May 4th, got to get on this, on May 4th, requesting approval from the minister for School District 61 to incur a deficit in budget for the 2021-2022 fiscal year as per BC School Act section 156 parentheses 12, which says a board must not incur a deficit of any kind unless the board has the approval of the minister. Thank you, Trustee McNally. Uh, so committee members, uh, that's an amendment to the agenda. So it has been moved. Um, Trustee McNally, I, I certainly, um, I think <laughs> your uh, rationale is there, but if you wanted to give just a brief rationale on that, I'd, I'd be open to that. I'd be quite happy to. Um, can I get rid of that hand? I don't know how to do yeah, that. Yeah, if you go into the reactions right. button, if you go into the reactions button, I think you can lower it. Lower um, hand, that would be There you thing. go. Okay, sure. Um, well, as no doubt it's clear to everybody by now, this um, I believe this proposed budget affects educational programs of the school district um, in an adverse way. And we've had many, many emails from the public and lots of conversations with the public. Um, we have till June to submit a budget. Uh, the GVTA president has said that the GVTA could deal with any staffing chaos that might result. 
Um, I really believe that any chaos resulting from a reset on this budget um, is not a problem of the same magnitude as allowing this budget to come forward on May 17th. But in the interim, I would really like to ask the um, Minister of Education to, uh, yeah, to give us the leeway to run a deficit budget this year so we don't have to um, do away with so many programs that are vital to students' mental health and educational welfare. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee McNally. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, committee, was there any further discussion? Yes, uh, Trustee Waters, please. I understand Trustee McNally's um, rationale for the motion. What I'm not understanding is the rationale for it to be heard at Ed Policy versus Ops. Regardless of which standing committee it's heard at, it goes to the May 17th board meeting. So uh, to me, this falls squarely under operations, which manages all of our financial and budget budgetary considerations. So um, perhaps Trustee McNally could clarify why she wants it heard at this table versus ops next Monday. Certainly. Sure. Um, sure. Thank you, Chair, uh, uh, Chair Trustee Waters. Yes, uh, Trustee McNally, please go ahead. Certainly. Um, well, there's a huge sense of urgency in the community is uh, uh, a primary reason. And bylaw 9130.1 gives the Education Policy and Direction Standing Committee the mandate to do the following, um, part B, considering matters affecting the educational programs of the school district and making recommendations where appropriate. So this definitely is about um, educational programs of the school district and my recommendation through the budget is that we write a letter. Why am I going all yellow and flashy? That we write um, a letter to the Minister of Education helping us with this dire circumstance. So this committee is an appropriate place. However, if the committee's wish via vote and majority is not to have it on the agenda of this committee, I will certainly bring it to ops. Thank you, Trustee McNally, and we appreciate the disco party that you provided us. That was certainly fun <laughs> to keep the meeting off. Uh, Trustee Waters, uh, go ahead. I appreciate the urgency. I think it's just good everybody to understand that it will come forward May 17th regardless. And so I just want to point us to bylaw 9130.2, which is the Operations Policy and Planning Committee, um, which says the meeting um, that ops shall meet uh, for the purpose of developing for board consideration major impact areas related to all financial and legal matters. So I won't be supporting this, but I think it's really appropriate that we have that discussion at ops next week. Certainly. Thank you, Trustee Waters. Any other comments from uh, trustees around the table? Uh, stakeholders are also free to chime in if they would like uh, as well. Uh, seeing and hearing none, uh, then I will go to a vote on the amendment. Uh, so all of those in favor of adding uh, Trustee McNally's motion to the agenda for tonight, please signify. Thank you. All those opposed? Thank you. And I will also vote opposed and the motion uh, to add that to the agenda fails. And so now we'll go back to the agenda as presented. Uh, were there any other amendments to the agenda? Uh, sorry, Trustee Duncan, I saw your hand up was... No, okay. <laughs> uh, so then on the, on the agenda as presented, if there's no additions, uh, then I will call for a vote for the agenda as presented. All those in favor, please signify. And that is unanimous. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll now go to approval of the minutes. And I believe that's where Trustee Duncan was getting ahead of me, I'm, I'm imagining. <laughs> no, <Nope>, all good. <laughs> oh, no, Thank okay. you, Chair. <laughs> no problem. I'm going to move the agenda. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Thank you. Um, okay. Approval of the minutes. Uh, so can I have a motion to approve the minutes then? Then from Trustee Ferris. Thank you very much. Uh, all those in favor of the minutes from April 6th, and that is unanimous. Thank you very much, everybody. Any business arising from the minutes? Uh, yes, Trustee Duncan, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wondered if we could get an update um, arising out of B3, I believe it was, of our minutes. Um, and uh, if there is a, a possibility that we have a date or a proposed date uh, for a working session for trustees around um, ass assessment. 
I wondered if uh, we've got uh, a month or just any updates around when we can expect that invitation to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Duncan. I'll either go to Deputy Superintendent Whitten or Superintendent Green for a uh, follow-up on that. Thank you. Um, so I'm just clarifying your question. You were asking about a workshop around the assessment um, professor report. Is that the assessment report you're speaking to? Yeah, the um, learning team presented last month and it led to a discussion about, um, it was an offer that was made by the team to provide a, a working session for trustees uh, around assessments um, and particularly around, well, all assessment, but I think the focus, the proposed focus was around psych ed assessments. And I just wondered if um, we have some uh, dates or possible dates um, yet. Thank you for the clarification. Um, Deb? Yeah, through the chair there, I don't have a date. We did talk about it with Sean and Pam, but I'll circle back to them and ask them if they've decided on date. Thank you, uh, uh, Trustee Duncan, for bringing that uh, back. And I know there's a lot going on and uh, appreciate staff's uh, um, support in helping bring that back to us. So thank you, everybody. Um, if there's no further business arising from the minutes, I'm happy to move on to our presentations. We have six tonight. Um, and the very first presentation is Education Assistance Supports. And I will turn the floor over to uh, Brett Gaylor. Uh, you have five minutes. Uh, I will make sure to flag for you uh, when we're when we're getting there but uh, I'll give you a bit of leeway so uh, no no pressure okay thanks chair and uh, thank you uh, everybody for uh, the opportunity to speak my name is Brett Gaylor um, I live in Fernwood and I'm happy to be here um, to share the story of my son Rowan's experience with education uh, assistance at school district 61 um, so Rowan was in kindergarten when um, my wife and I realized that he was developing differently than other kids his age. Um, we were super lucky that we had a lovely kindergarten teacher. Um, some of you may know or know of Madame Rebecca at George Jay, so a wonderful teacher uh, who was really great at working at ways to include Rowan uh, in the class. But as he got older, we saw that his classroom experience was deteriorating. Um, when his classroom his classmates would work independently. Rowan's challenges with executive functioning got in the way of him getting down to assignments. Things that most kids took for granted, like how to play on the playground or talk about what he knew and what he was learning, Rowan couldn't do on his own. And he was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder at the end of that kindergarten year. At the start of grade one, we made an inclusive education plan. Uh, one was made for Rowan, and in the subsequent three years at George J, um, my wife and I collaborated with multiple principals, vice principals, teachers, uh, and learning support teachers to create many different IEPs. These documents painted a holistic portrait of Rowan's learning needs, and all the educators we worked with knew what he needed. He needed resistive activity to self-regulate and keep his energy up. He needed adaptive technology, so his delayed his delays in motor skills didn't get in the way of showing his learning. He needed an education assistance help to scaffold social skills in the classroom and playground. And he needed EAs to help his teacher and our team be accountable for what we were trying to measure. And he needed their help to chunk out the work into steps for him. But report card after report card, Roan was coming home with empty duo tangs and uncompleted worksheets. And slowly we began to understand that he was being bullied at school. Rowan would hide at recess and started talking about self-harm at home, and we knew we needed to do something. When we met with the same team that we built his IEP with, we were told that it was still the right IEP. The school just didn't have the EAs to implement it. Sometimes Rowan's class would have an EA that was split between two or three other kids, but often just as soon as that EA sat down to help him, that EA would be pulled out of the classroom to go put out a fire somewhere else at the school or run another program. Basically, the school didn't have the resources to do the work to include Rowan in the class. We tried to make a go of it at George J, but eventually we switched out of School District 61 to self-design because we knew that we could direct his autism funding towards the educators and support Rowan needed to be able to learn. And I'm happy to say that he has flourished this year. He's a happy kid with plenty of friends 
who reads and writes and does math and makes art and works on projects. And that's what we all want for our kids and that's why all of you are here. But here's the thing, the experience that he has now, that Rowan has now, it demands that I work from home. It demands that I have flexible enough schedule that I can pick him up and drop him off. It demands we have a computer at home, time to research and basically be the principal for his learning. Basically, it demands that we are privileged enough to be able to cut our work schedules in half and still be able to financially support our family. When Rowan was a student at School District 61, the EA supports at his school were not sufficient for the needs of the students. And I'm pretty sure the situation is the same there this year. So if the 2021-22 budget reduces any of those hours or positions or, positions or supports, more kids like Rowan will be excluded from learning. And those kids whose families don't have the economic means to make the kind of sacrifices that Rowan's family did, they won't be included in their classroom. They'll struggle. Their bodies and their brains will constantly be in fight or flight mode, and their EAs will keep getting reassigned to high incident students or emergency situations. I hope you all understand that this is an equity issue. The most vulnerable will be the most hurt from any reduction of EA supports. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much for that, Brett, and for your story about Rowan and the experiences that you've had. I know that um, I've certainly listened and heard and, and I know my colleagues have as well. So thank you for that. Um, okay, uh, so we will go now to uh, Reading Recovery, uh, Rochelle D. Funk, uh, the floor is yours. Can everybody hear me this evening? Yeah, you're perfect. Thank you very much. I would like to begin by acknowledging that my family and I live and work in the traditional territory of the Longwangans people. And I really do wanna express my gratitude to the trustees that are here tonight and other attendees as well. Um, I'm here because I'm a parent at James Bay Community School. And I'm also the current chair of our parent advisory council. As a parent, I have firsthand experience of the truly transformative impact that reading recovery has on students. And if you had asked me three years ago if I would have this knowledge and that reading recovery would have such an impact, um, I wouldn't have believed you. My daughter, Alexandra, has had a life full of books. She has literally been read to since the moment we brought her home. Uh, her second home, other than Starbucks, which was on the way to the library, has been the library. Uh, she has been talking about stories and has had a life full of stories. And my job is actually as a writer. So literacy in our house has been there front and center from the day uh, she arrived. And she got through kindergarten and did very well. And she got into grade one and had a wonderful teacher and was there for a couple of months. And she really started to struggle at home. And uh, this is the birth, uh, if people aren't parents, of when picture books stay at school and chapter books begin to come home. And with every day, my daughter, who used to love books and being with a book and sitting with a book, began to hate books. And that's terrifying when you realize that literacy is the basis um, for every child's future. Um, Monday to Friday would end up with a crying fit from my well-behaved, um, very funny kid. And then uh, October came and her wonderful grade one teacher said to me, um, almost at a lark that she had had thrown out Sandra in for the testing pool for reading recovery and to her shock, um, she actually tested that she needed that additional support. Her teacher was surprised. Her grade one uh, kindergarten teacher, who the grade one teacher hooked into, was also surprised. I was relieved because I actually thought that I was broken, that I wasn't going to be a parent that knew how to support my child, and that now she'd been identified for, ex for needing this extra lift. And I was relieved, not just for myself, um, because it was very frightening and very frustrating, but because 
literally in about a two and a half week period while these books were coming home. And, and if you're a parent, you know, things start to escalate very quickly. Alexandra went from a girl who loved going to school, who loved being with books. If you asked her, was she smart? She said, yes. She very quickly turned into a girl who was not smart. She didn't want to go to school. She didn't like books. She didn't want to go to a library anymore. And the one that was the worst for me is that she was not as smart as her friends. And it took less than a month to go from one story to the other. Reading Recovery with Ursula McDonald was um, like uh, going to the ER. Ursula knew instantly how to connect with Alexandra and how to listen to Alexandra and gave her tools that I know her classroom teacher didn't have time for. Um, I think you're probably have heard that from parents that have come to speak to you on all of these various supports, but her teacher also had a very full classroom and so couldn't also give them to her. But the biggest win I think is twofold is Ms. McDonald and Alexander working together is they unpacked Alexandra's story of defeat. Because when she worked through the program with Ursula McDonald, she learned that importantly, she can ask for help and she will get help if she asks, that she's worthy of getting help. And if she works, she will grow. And then I think this is the bigger one of all of them is that she learns differently. And she had that validated with being with Ms. McDonald. And that although she learns differently, she's just as smart as her peers and she belongs in her classroom with those peers. Now, I'm not, this is no glory run where now, you know, she's gonna be the, the great writer and reader of all time. She still has challenges. Um, like every kid, reading is still a little bit of a challenge for her. But the difference maker is now she has the tools and she has proven to herself that she can, with those tools, overcome the challenges and diversity. Um, Hi, Rochelle, I'm just going to ask you to just tie it that, into a book. That's us. absolutely, yeah. yeah. So this is critical, a critical intervention. We all know where kids like Alexandra end up. I went to school with one of them. Her name is Carrie Rigby. She's a nationally recognized literacy um, advocate. Uh, she was illiterate and a single parent and didn't know how to give her child medication. If she'd had this program at that time, she might not have been there. And I just wanted to end as a, a member of the PAC at our school. We're a community school and we have a lot of have not in our school right now. We have parents that don't have any education. If you pull programs like this, they, and they don't get them in a the classroom, that level of equity that's represented in these programs will disappear out of our school and that sense of fairness of public education. So I know you have a hard uh, task ahead of you, but to me, literacy and teaching to the student is a baseline of the things we need to keep. Thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. Really appreciate the story that you shared with us and, um, and, and connecting it through to that early intervention. That, that's an important piece for us to hear. Thank you. Uh, we'll now go to our third presentation on reading, uh, uh, our third presentation, reading recovery from Sally Bashong. Sally, I apologize if I pronounced your name wrong in any way, please feel free to correct me. No problem. It's a Swiss name. So a lot of people get it wrong. It's Bashong, not a problem. <laughs> I was so close. <laughs> you were very close. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and share my screen here. And then I'm going to make, I'm going to try and make sure you just see the screen the PowerPoint itself, and I'm going to need a moment or two to just make sure that that happens. No worries. I haven't started your timer yet. We'll wait for you to get going. Okay. Uh, so I think I do this, and then I do this, I think, <laughs> and then, nope, that's not what I do. I'm going to stop that share. Try again. Sorry. All right, I'm going to do this. I wonder why this is not working. You may end up just seeing my um, notes, but that's okay. You can read them along. Okay, so do you all see a 
screen. Yes, yeah, see your PowerPoint, Sally. Yes, you do. Okay. We have right. notes as well. We have, do you see my notes as well? We do. So if you want to, uh, do you know the slide share, the slideshow icon, uh, bottom right next to the left of the slider? The well, left it's, of, it's, it's at the top here. And there as well, sorry, that, that way. Okay. Also. Yep. I've got and the slideshow, yeah. And then from beginning, uh, the yep. left-hand menu item. Yep. But then I don't see my notes. <laughs> Right, sorry, it's it's one or the other, unfortunately, um, okay. in terms of what you want to share. Okay, well, I had it worked out. I'm sorry, I had it worked out with being able to see my notes but not have to share them, but that's fine because I'm just going to read them anyway. And if you'd like that's to okay. read them. It's the fun of technology and Zoom yeah. in this platform. It's totally okay. <laughs> I even rehearsed uh, this with my son. So I we'll see, sorry, Before you go, Sally, I'm sorry, I see Trustee Duncan has her hand up. Perhaps she's going to offer us a helpful tip. Yes, Hopefully, thank you. Maybe. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wonder, it's your presentation, I believe, is in our packup, but I'm wondering if Andy or the chair could sh uh, no. share no, the packup presentation. No, um, it's, it's, it's not. It, no. Yeah. no, it's not. Okay. Sorry. Okay, that's okay. We'll go ahead, Sally. You can, you can go ahead and start. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So here we go. I'm going to just get this reduced. So that I can see what I'm doing. Okay, so here I go. Um, hello, I'm Sally Boschung, and I am one of the teacher leaders for Reading Recovery, Intervention Préventive en Lecture et Écriture, supporting School District 61 as part of the Tri-District Reading Recovery Consortium. I was trained by the Canadian Institute of Reading Recovery, as a, uh, which is a registered Canadian charity whose dual mandate is to support young children struggling to read, and to uphold the effectiveness of this specialized intervention. I'm passionate about helping struggling readers and I'm also passionate about the need for equitable support for struggling French immersion students. I'd like to clarify what I think are three misunderstandings around reading recovery. The number of children served by a trained reading recovery teacher, the cost and what your district gets for your contribution to the consortium. So let's start with this num the numbers. This year, this year, your contribution paid for the training and ongoing teacher leader guidance for your reading recovery teachers to accomplish this. Just look at those numbers. The total reading recovery staffing comes to, if you add it all up, about 7.7 .7 FTE. If those were 7.7 .7 teachers, each would serve 16 nearly a full class of the most challenged learners. But with the current FTE arrangement, they can also use their training to have significant impact on, and this is the most recent conservative estimate, around 400 other students in ELL, small groups, push-in support, and on and on and on. How can they do this? Because of their rigorous year-long training, which your contribution helps pay for. But with life changes like retirements, mat leaves, moves, this year long intensive training is not available. And if it's not available, future holders of these positions won't have that specialized training or the guidance of a teacher leader to make this kind of far reaching impact. The training includes 22 two and a half hour sessions from September to June, and at least five coaching visits from the teacher leader. Elsewhere, reading recovery training is recognized as a postgraduate level course. Such intensive training yields skilled literacy experts. Trainees learn to teach from an understanding of complex literacy processing. They integrate individualized, individualized instruction of phonics, phonemic awareness, sight words, concepts about print, language structures into the reading and writing of real text. So what else does your district get for your yearly contribution to the Tri-District Reading Recovery Consortium? Well, you'll, after this, this presentation, I will email you the long list of services, but for the purposes of the presentation, I will highlight the sessions for trained reading recovery teachers. And this year, the extra support that is going to 
the French immersion reading recovery teachers, since this is the first year the implementation has had French teacher leader support, and also extra support for the teachers whose training was halted last year due to COVID. There's also assistance with final assessments, year-end data collection, tracking of the previous year's reading recovery students, and the annual reading recovery year-end summary report. And this is given to your district liaison. The reading recovery teacher leader also uh, works to foster collaboration and build all primary teachers capacity in literacy instruction through workshops, consults, meetings, etc. A specific example this year is our COVID response plan and half of uh, your district's reading recovery schools chose this option and offered six weeks of intensive collaborative support for students most affected by COVID school closures. It received universally positive feedback from principals and teachers. And because the pandemic continues, we are working on a reading recovery COVID response part two option for next year. Sally, I'm just gonna give you a 30 second warning. Oh dear. <laughs> Paul Pantaleo is uh, the School District 61's literacy expert, and he says, reading recovery is the best literacy training one can have bar none. And all schools need reading recovery, small group intervention, and good classroom teaching. I'd like you to imagine as I fi finish up, somebody suffering from a condition that prevents them from being able to walk. Will a group fitness class help them to learn to walk? or a specialized group of a Pilates specialization, small group, or will they need uh, to work with a trained specialist? Research shows that the most at-risk students gain minimum benefit from classroom and small group work. They need intensive individualized program designed by a trained specialist. So is reading recovery really expensive? Not if you consider the high cost of literacy, illiteracy is expensive. And my final word, it may be helpful as you consider this to connect with other Canadian jurisdictions who after replacing reading recovery with a package program or a homegrown solution or because of perceived financial savings later chose to reverse their decision because of a marked reduction in their primary literacy rates and an expressed need from their pr primary classroom teachers. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Sally, for that presentation. And uh, despite the technical challenges, we made our way through it. So okay. thank you so much for that. Um, we'll just get you to stop sharing your screen and then we can come back. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sally. Really appreciate that. Um, next, we will go to Reading Recovery, Amy Ballantyne. Amy, uh, the floor is over to you. But before I do, um, sorry, I see Trustee McNally's hand up. So Trustee McNally, go ahead, please. Hi, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, just a quick comment on Sally's presentation. Um, the slide about the uh, data collection at the end of the year brings back such fond memories of 10 years of doing that. I've never seen any data collection like reading recovery. It's so comprehensive. Um, and my 10 years in reading recovery were the best and most gratifying teaching I've ever done. So thank you so much, Sally, for presenting tonight. Thank you for that, Trustee McNally. Okay, uh, we will go to Amy Ballantyne. Amy, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. I'm just going to share my screen here. Hopefully that, that's showing up. Looks good. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, so thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Amy Ballantyne. Um, I'm a reading recovery and inclusive learning teacher at View Royal Elementary. Um, I was actually trained to be a reading recovery by, by Paul Pantaleo in 2009. Um, tonight, I just want to share um, about how reading recovery plays a very strategic role in the literacy development of vulnerable students in our elementary schools. Uh, I just wanted to start with how um, on April 9th, all SD61 employees received a letter from Shelley Green just regarding the draft budget proposal. Not surprisingly, parts of the letter resonated with me as it aligns with our school beliefs and teaching practices in a positive and hopeful way. So one of those parts reads this. In our school district, the majority of our students are very successful, but there are key indicators that highlight where we have not moved our students' results over time. We must focus on this priority regardless of budget constraints. 
if our goal truly is the success of all students. Um, I just, I can't agree more with this statement and we can all imagine who those students are that we're talking about. Um, they're the students, you know, whose trajectory and education will falter unless we catch them before they fall. They're the students who need social emotional needs met, whether it be with a counselor or in a music class. They're the ones that need the inclusive ed teachers, the literacy specialist teachers, and the EAs to guide them uh, in order to give them the tools that they need to succeed. Uh, at elementary school, you can say that we are perhaps in the business of early intervention, and I'd like to think that literacy is the heart of it all. And um, in reading recovery, these vulnerable students are our priority. Here's another quote, um, and it sums up why we need to intervene for children at an in an individual and purposeful manner. So it says, learning to read and to write is a task of great importance. For most, this process goes well, but for some children, learning involves the formation of missing or weak links and causes devious roots and unproductive literacy outcomes. So this is why vulnerable and at-risk students need additional instruction in reading and writing above and beyond what classroom instruction and even small group instruction can provide. We cannot allow our students and vulnerable students to flounder as this instills failure, frustration, fragility, shame, embarrassment, not to mention how it affects our overall graduation rates. Reading recovery needs to be there for our Indigenous learners, our ELL students, and our students with IEPs. Um, Sally just shared this, but this is um, Scarborough's Reading Rope, and it was actually developed by um, a, a woman who uh, is a literacy specialist and psychologist, and she designed the Reading Rope to demonstrate how um, there's so many complexities involved in learning how to read. So the upper five strands of the rope are woven together to represent all that is involved in language comprehension, while the bottom three strands um, show what is involved in word recognition. And it should be noted that all of these components in this reading rope are integrated into regular reading recovery lessons. However, as complex as this visual representation of reading is, it is the job of the trained reading recovery teacher to identify what parts of a child's literacy learning are intact and what parts need to be strengthened in order to build a strong lasting literacy foundation. Um, I also want to explain to you about a scenario that plays out in my school every September. Uh, so we have a team of around a dozen people and we meet to discuss the results of what is called a reading recovery tentative selection. Uh, the team consists of kindergarten and grade one teachers, school-based team members, our SLP, reading recovery teacher leader, and administrators. The students on this list are who, for whatever reason, have had difficulty accessing regular classroom literacy teachings. As a result, the reading recovery teacher assesses each student on their reading level and six other assessments. The results of these seven assessments and the correlating stay nines are listed on this spreadsheet. The team discuss the results and then determine who the most vulnerable students are and thus will have a reading recovery uh, position. This collaboration and team approach is what makes reading recovery specialists in the school very unique. So we have a literacy network, you could say, and as a result, we have essentially touched more children than just our reading recovery students. And I know Sally um, touched on that as well. Amy, I'm just gonna give you a 30 second warning. Okay, thanks. Um, and I just wanted to quickly mention that at one of our meetings uh, a couple of years ago, it was recognized by a kindergarten teacher um, that one of the assessments was just falling a little bit short. And it just shows the power of this because um, not only are we noticing some of the, the deficits here, but I could argue that our stay nines became higher as a result of that kindergarten teacher noticing and then adjusting her literacy program. So it just shows how far reaching we can actually be with our students. Uh, I just wanted to end with just saying that now is the time. Now is the time to make vulnerable students our priority and our responsibility. So let's be literacy leaders in our district and let's give vulnerable students an equal and inclusive opportunity. They deserve it. Thanks. Thanks so much, Amy, for that insight uh, and your advocacy. Uh, I really, uh, I appreciate it. And, and I'm certain that others here do as well. So, and thank you for your work. Uh, it's certainly valued and valuable. Thank you.
Um, I will now move on to our fifth presentation, Music and Strings Programs in SD61. Megan Taylor, Megan, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for allowing me to speak to you today. I am a parent in the district um, and obviously the district anticipates a budget shortfall. So of course, um, we begin to examine what student programs should be cut. And parents and educators are asked to essentially rank those programs. Um, and in some ways they're kind of pitted against each other, um, which I, I don't like to see. And I'd just like to say that I don't mean to suggest in anything that I'm about to say that I think that any one program is more important than another. I don't believe in cutting student programs and I don't believe that that's the answer. Um, I think we need to look for better solutions. But I wanted to provide you some insight into a program that is important to our family. And that is early music education and particularly instrument education, which has been critical to our family. Cutting music in any form degrades and diminishes each child's education in this district. I think that music seems to some like an easy answer because it's perceived as an extra thing. It's not usually spoken of as a core subject. And I think that that sort of thinking is wrong. I think that kind of thinking compartmentalizes education into silos, but learners don't learn like that. Education can't be compartmentalized, um, not for the best outcomes, for the greatest number of learners, because they're each different. One of my three children has high functioning anxiety and a selective mutism. And she isn't in the group of students in the greatest need in the district. And it often seems as though the school is ill-equipped to help her. Uh, she doesn't disrupt the classroom. And as a consequence, she frequently falls through the cracks. She spends her whole day memorizing every detail of every interaction and is constantly overwhelmed by the chaos of her school and her classmates. And she suffers through all of that in silence, not because she chooses to, but because her body won't let her. And I don't mean to diminish her condition at all, but in some ways it's a bit, it's a bit like a pop bottle. Like you walked around with a pop bottle and you shook it all day long. And it's gonna explode. But if you slowly release the cap, you can release some of that pressure. And for her, and for many other children like her, choir and instruments in particular, um, and other kinds of physical activity um, that break them from the intensity of having to sit in a desk um, with all the intensity of those noises around them. They act as a release valve. It allows her to go to school with passion and commitment and joy instead of dread um, because Music is amazing to her. It is an escape. It relieves the stress of the school environment and it's critical for her and others to be able to then learn. Um, and it, it, it's, it's, it is a core subject because it integrates a variety of subject areas all at once. Playing a musical instrument is, uh, it, it stimulates your neural processing. It enhances speech. It increases reading comprehension. Um, it, it, it helps children with time management and discipline. But most of all, for my child, it connects people. It connects students. It develops community. Um, and it includes students who 
are neurologically diverse and may not easily find community in school. Megan, I'm just going to give you a quick uh, 30 second warning. Yeah. So for us, music education is a critical part of our school system. And when it's provided early and frequently, um, the benefits associated with it are immense. And to echo a parent who has already spoken in front of me, it's not then just for the privileged. Every student in every school in the district should have access to it. That's what public education is about. It shouldn't just be for those who can afford it um, and who can afford the economic advantage of it. And so I would just ask that the trustees and the school district think outside the box. They do something different than just cut the programs because the kids need them. Thanks, Megan. Thank you for the power of your story and the passion with which you shared it. Um, it's, it's, yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, it's not lost on any of us, so thank you. Uh, we'll go to our last presentation now, inclusivity and student supports, Brianna Day. Brianna, welcome, the floor is yours. Can't quite hear you. Let's take the headphones off, can you hear me now? Perfect. <sighs> Inclusiveness, defined as including everyone, especially allowing and accommodating people who have historically been excluded because of their race, gender, sexuality, or ability. Inclusive education requires flexible, generous, ongoing support in every school and classroom. SD61 supposedly provides an inclusive learning environment for our children. That is far from reality and will be further from reality if these cuts proceed. You are failing these children who only want the opportunity to learn with their peers and have an enriching and challenging education. You're too far removed from reality if you can even contemplate cuts to EAs, counseling, and family liaison workers. From the comfort of your desks, you need to stop making sweeping statements like, our students are doing very well. That is a quote from the April 12th meeting by Secretary Treasurer Morris. You need to stop because you're speaking to parents of children who are not doing very well. I'm one of those parents. A parent who feels unheard and unsupported by the board despite being outspoken. I have been frustrated to tears watching mine and countless other children's needs go unprioritized for yet another school year. My saving grace at these times has been a visit with Layla Dursey, the family liaison worker at George J Elementary. If you don't know Layla, then you're missing out. And you should know her if you're going to take her job away. She is tireless, essential, and at the heart of the George J family. You have already taken our parent resource room, among other things. Taking away Layla, EA positions, and food programs will drastically and negatively affect the health of the population of the school. You speak of building equality, which should always be lifting, lifting others to join in opportunity, rather than what you're proposing, which removes beneficial programming from some of your most vulnerable students and their families. Inclusive education requires early recognition of disparate needs and learning challenges. Another statement from April 12th, we are spending more than we are funded for. If that's true, then why are the cuts affecting students whose needs are currently not being met? We have children whose learning needs have not yet been identified and we cannot call that inclusion. I'm a parent whose child has managed to slip through the cracks I happen to be lucky enough and privileged enough to pay for ongoing counseling and to pay $3,000 out of pocket for a psych ed evaluation outside of the school system four years, four years after a need for support was recognized and requested. That's too long to wait. And my child would still be waiting if I did not have the means to take action myself. This matters because knowing students' needs ensures proper EA funding. I was here two years ago advocating for more EA hours. Now we're moving backwards in a pandemic. 
yikes. This lack of support is already contributing to lapses in self-regulation, even causing school-wide lockdowns. Is this the legacy any of you wants to leave behind? There needs to be minimal weight for psych ed evaluations and they need to be accessible to everyone. Inclusive education requires appropriate funding. You cannot look at our district's average investments on paper, compare them to other districts, and pat yourselves on the back that we are not the bottom of the pack. You cannot create a race to the bottom, slashing all so-called ingrained initiatives on your way down. We won't let you do that. When cuts are needed, especially because of gross mismanagement of projects or desired changes to policy, children's programs and supports are the last place to look. We won't let you forget that. What pains me the most is that you all seem to know that there is recourse for you to avoid these cuts. But instead of standing up to either the ministry or the superintendent, you would take from children in the midst of a crisis. Children in need of stability and hope. Brianna, I'm just going to give you a 30 second warning. Yeah, I'm wrapping up. We need your support here. And in turn, you have our support should the provincial government fail to see sense. The simplest way to sum this up is to say, no matter how you try to shuffle priorities, you cannot fulfill your mandate within this budget. To your top priority for funding must always be the students and to make inclusion work, you need to understand it, believe in it and invest in it. Your only option moving forward is to reject this budget on moral grounds. Thank you. Thank you, Brianna, for your presentation. Um, and thank you everybody tonight who came and presented to us. I know it can often be a daunting task uh, for some, maybe more than others. Um, but I, I certainly, speaking as the chair, appreciate everything that everyone's had to say, and I know that we're all taking it in. So thank you. Um, we'll now move on to new business. And for those who presented, you're welcome to stay. Uh, you know, stay and enjoy the rest of the meeting. We have more presenta another presentation uh, coming. So uh, by all means, uh, you're welcome to stay uh, with us here. Uh, so now we'll move on to new business. Uh, uh, our district team update, transforming libraries. Our district team vice principal, Dave Shortread. Dave, uh, pleasure to see you. Happy to have you here. Um, and uh, I will uh, turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me and see this slide? All right, Perfect. thanks for having me, everyone. Thanks, Andy, for your support. Um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to share with you guys tonight. Um, we have a journey to share and an honor of hard work that's been done by our teacher librarians and schools over the past few years. Our libraries are important places and they're powerful for learning, sharing, and creating. They drive the reading culture of the school and they help that and they bring innovative ways to learn and share across our schools. Tonight I'm going to share some of the barriers that we um, face and some of the challenges, give you an update on some of the solutions we came up with and the work that's underway and some next steps. I'm proud to say that we've come together, the group of TLs, the district team, and our schools in some strength and collaboration. So uh, I wanted to make sure that you see and that we see that the lens of our work with our teacher librarians is through our strategic plan. As we consider our libraries, we look to create inclusive and culturally responsive um, learning environments for all. We look to see how we can best support our Indigenous learners in culturally responsive ways. And it's this alignment that's important um, as we are all wanting to head in the same direction. Now, often what is being explored in the library spaces whether it's the different roles or the layouts or the resources, this can also appear in the classroom. So we see that investment in the libraries is also investing in classrooms. It's a catalyst for change and innovation in a school building. Threaded through the district team operational plan, as well as the district plan, we're specifically when we're thinking about TLs, we're looking to provide equitable, culturally responsive learning opportunities and resources. And we feel that teacher librarians play a key role in a building to move this forward. And I'm thankful to be able to report out how this work is underway. So as we align with the strategic goals and the 
district operational goals, we become stronger together, all these pieces pulling together. We use this graphic within our district team, sharing with our school leaders, and it shows that we have strength together. It's with our work with our teacher librarians and libraries, that it's with the resource and expertise and the spaces, all within a, a pretty drastically evolving library landscape. But always at the heart of what we're doing is it's for students. So as I open with a horse historical review, this is before 2017, a bit of the landscape for us and some of the main challenges we had. We needed a shared philosophy and a vision of how our libraries across our schools could contribute to the school's culture of collaboration. We needed to have support and mentorship for our TLs, often many of them in part-time positions, operating silos by themselves. We had limited access to district purchased um, digital resources often weren't working or not accessible because it was up for the TL to, to maintain that with their um, small part-time position. And we had inequitable access to resources. It was important and what I observed at the time was that coordination was really important. The consistency and message, the equity in the team building was really what was going to make momentum. So in 2017, um, I did present at the board um, and we asked for a position and we were given $100,000 and the task was to create and coordinate with the Teacher Librarian Association and the GBTA how to best utilize $100,000 of surplus money at the time. So we started to work. We started to co-design projects um, using that release time and we up until now, we have been carefully using and diligently working to, to make sure that that continues. And it's infused now within our district team work. Our focus and goal is to provide equitable access to resources. And we always kept the student learning experience at the focus through flexibility and choice. So you might have probably asked like, why are we talking transforming libraries? Well, it was this resource that was really key for us. It was a book by Ron Starker, and it talks about and advocates about how our libraries are starting to go away. And if, if we, we need to do something about it, and we need to support our libraries to become points of collaboration, spaces for innovation, and where authentic learning occurs. Libraries have really transformed over the last decade. They've come from a place that was quiet, and you would go and check out a book and you take it away. And now what we're seeing is, if that was the grocery store in the analogy, we're seeing that now people are coming into the libraries to create. It's a noisy landscape. There are facilitated quiet spots, but overall the, the basis of a library and the sound of the library is changing. So um, we needed to bring to the organization this kind of vision and we needed strategy to do it. And so we had this driving question, how do we support libraries to provide culture responsive and equitable learning opportunities for all learners? We continue to work through that question in many conversations and presentations. So if um, I can go back in time to 2018, we needed to come in alignment just as teacher librarians. We came across this organization called Future Ready Schools that had a future libra uh, ready librarian sector of the organization. And it articulated a great thing for us. It showed us that we shouldn't be um, competing or advocating against other pieces of the organization as libraries and teacher librarians. But it really helped us see that we needed to be more aligned, that learners were at the center and uh, teacher librarians were involved in all of this work. In fact, it was more that the teacher librarian was to facilitate the learning culture and it needed to be in line with the school goals and the strategic plan. So we had an ed camp on a Saturday facilitated by me and some teacher librarians and opened it up at the time to join the conversation. We had teacher librarians coming from all over the province and we built trust within the TLs and the organization all heading in the same direction and all um, wanting to execute a similar plan. So the first step of our plan was to create a shared vision of what we believe in SD61 about our libraries. And this continues to evolve, um, into, in, but it, it, this is a statement of belief that we are rallying around 
that we are sharing with our school leadership and that we're sharing with our teacher librarians. And it's our library support learning and literacy by, by providing equitable, culture responsive and inclusive learning environments for our school community to collaborate, communicate, share, create, research and facilitate inquiry. So I would be admiss to make sure that we recognize that it has been a difficult year for all of us. And in the time of COVID, taking a moment to recognize all of our teacher librarians and organization who their roles were drastically changed this year. Particular, I, I do want to consider this group that you're looking at. These are gifted and talented teacher librarians in our school district that have stepped forward and led projects with release time, have stepped into the unknown and gone above and beyond and done great work. And so I wanted to sell, take a chance to celebrate some of the projects that were done with the funding that was provided from the board in the last few years. First was, um, if we want to talk about the library being a, the hub or the heart of the school, we needed to start to, to invest in our teacher librarians. We saw the need for this to come to fruition as a network, of, uh, a mentorship network that was set up by TLs for TLs. We, this is how we were able to move from a pocket of great work and but that was stuck in silos to more of a culture of this is what a teacher librarian does and this is what is possible. And it was a shift that the TLs helped me be a driver of new ideas and helped us in new ways to teach and learn. It was a shared space and role that facilitated staff learning and became a and is always a key ally in pro D design and execution for any teacher. And again, the, the library. If you can imagine it like a kitchen space, it's not a grocery store you're going to pick things up. You're going to receive a mentorship and you're doing things alongside each other. And that's what this the library is, is meant to be. There were a number of renovations and new library spaces that happened in our school district that reached out for vision statements around the physical layout. What kind of spaces should appear in a, in a library? And the answer was, there should be a whole bunch of different spaces. There should be opportunities to go and um, have a space for a presentation, for a staff meeting, or for a big group, but then also have space for um, quiet time that they could go and work on their own, space for collaboration, and that the flexibility. We saw things being put on wheels. We saw barriers being able to be moved around. And um, as, as some schools started libraries from nothing, they really used this inclusive model um, to, to be, a gen, be a basis for their designs. A big project that, was, that is definitely worth celebrating is our library websites. Before we had library websites, it was up to the teacher librarian on their own to try and manage. There was no coordination and no support. We needed a house to host digital resources, and even some of them were being paid at a district level and not being accessed. Ben Conan and Travis Ritchie, two talented TLs in our school district working across four schools right now, they have built this site and maintained it over the last few years. It's uh, elibrary.sd61.bc.ca and it's linked on every library, um, every elementary school um, site. And it was key to, to land there because we heard loud and clear from our elementary teacher librarian colleagues that they didn't want to have to maintain and generate a site on their own with their point something FTE. And thankfully, this was in place when we had COVID. And we saw that the use of this website skyrocket across the province. It was the best of the best of what we could um, pull together as a whole teacher librarian team to benefit all of our schools. And then it was seen to benefit schools across the province. At the middle and secondary library website level, they were able to create their own. The middle level, um, we found a sweet spot where we were able to synchronize a big chunks of the website to contribute to some collaboration. So if one teacher librarian found a great resource, it was able to be automatically added with one click to all of the websites. And yet they wanted to maintain a community feel. They wanted to be able to target their community um, and they had the more time to invest in that. 
So they became their own library websites. So now if you go to any school lab, any school website and you go over to the far right, you will find the library website. And um, that's something that we should and can be proud of. Now, um, working with the ITL department, we provided supports for users to maintain a database of services that manages millions of dollars worth of learning resources and, equip and equipment in our school district. A collection's only as good as like how you can search it and access it. We worked this year and last year to improve the experience for both TLs, staff and students in a project tax task force. We worked in partnership with the, the IT department um, to improve all of this experience. We've also been able to figure and learn destiny and sharing the collections that pulls from not only physical resources, but digital resources too. And now this can occur and be shared across schools. Students have begun to be, be able to view the catalog digitally and put bo uh, books on hold. And that was really important during COVID. Another way that our libraries have been transforming is be, um, beginning to include maker spaces. If you're unfamiliar with the maker space, is it's a space to create, design, rebuild, recreate. It includes coding and digital literacy. It's a mindset sh shift and it's a, it's a culture shift for a library uh, and school to provide opportunities like this. And these platforms and materials and how they can be transmedia storytelling or engaging or tinkering activities to share their learning. The maker spaces have evolved from cardboard creations to emphasis on non-consumables, coding, and making instead of digital literacy. So we've provided and worked with the Pathways and Partnerships um, Department and teacher librarians were able to assemble some reasoning or inquiry and a list of things that they'd wanna um, explore in a maker grant. And we've been able to support every elementary school with purchasing these materials and they're in every elementary school library now. And we're working to work with middle schools next year. Um, the ADST curriculum, which was new a few years ago with our redesigned curriculum as well, um, and the design thinking and the career education aspects of these maker spaces was a great fit um, as staff and students were um, kind of exploring this all the way from kindergarten to grade 12. A final piece I'd want to update you on, um, on is our Indigenous department uh, in partnership with them is on decolonizing our libraries. It's a webinar series that this started a few years ago with questions from our teacher librarians regarding the resources that they should be having or providing or the ones that they should be removing from their libraries. And so we had originally planned to bring all teacher librarians together for a day of experience at the Songhees Wellness Center last May. But when COVID hit and this prevented, this prevented our work and stalled us, but now it's appearing as an after school webinar. Now it's not as good as being in person, but what I can share is the one benefit of the virtual format is now we have 150 teacher librarians registered across our province, tuning into our conversation that we're having with UVic indigenous librarians on how we're taking steps to indigenize libraries and to decolonize practices in our libraries too. We are looking to represent diverse perspectives in our collections and noticing that decolonizing libraries is a mindset and it's a process and it's through several conversations along the way. So as for our next steps, we're gonna to continue to coordinate and um, provide access across schools to our resources through those websites and through a culture of sharing across our teacher librarians. We're gonna be looking to how to re share resources um, through our catalog functionality um, as that continues to evolve and make sure that it's managed in a way that students can access the things that they're looking for in an easy way and that teacher librarians can input things in that, into that catalog in an easy way and that the teacher librarians are supported in that. We had two new um, aspects that we're building into next fall. One was a, a year launch. We heard. And we felt over the years that it was so valuable to pull everyone together. There's an aspect of equity when it comes to um, providing after school webinars, 
after school meetings or um, during Pro-D days where we're actually hoping for our teacher librarians to be involved in at the center of those Pro-D days. So we look to host a first ever town hall on the first Friday of the year next year to bring in uh, speaker Rebecca Rubio, who is a district teacher librarian in Richmond to speak um, about diversity, about coordination, and then have a day of collaboration. The next new project that we're gonna creatively look to see how we can continue is a diversity scan. This involves teacher librarian taking a careful look at the collection and making sure that it's representing the student population that is there. And so those are the um, last two items and that is my last slide. And thank you for your time, you guys. It's been a nice, um, nice task to summarize the work over the last few years on this portfolio. And it's been a pleasure of mine to work with our teacher librarians. Thank you so much for that presentation, uh, District Vice Principal Shortreed. Uh, I, I have so many thoughts about the amazing work being done and just looking at how we are clearly uh, leading the pack uh, in so many ways. So uh, thank you to you and the entire team. Uh, I'm gonna open the floor for any questions that folks might have, trustees, stakeholders, or members of the public might have. And just a reminder, best practice is always to direct questions through the chair. Uh, so I will go first to, to Trustee Duncan, who has a question. Go ahead, Trustee Duncan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of questions um, through the chair to um, Mr. Shortreed, and uh, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you for the presentation. It's um, an exciting one to see all of the good work going on, and in particular, the, the collaboration um, linked to the strategic plan and to school plans and to supporting our, our libraries. Um, and great to see the student focus in that. I can't imagine uh, how relieved uh, you and the team and everyone was to have those digital resources available to them, uh, given everything that we've all and our students in particular have been through this uh, year. But I actually wanted to uh, first focus on uh, the digital resource side of things. And I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit for us um, how students at, at the various uh, grade levels can currently access those digital resources, if it's something that they do during library time or if they can access those, those digital resources at any point in their school day or at home when they're doing their homework. Thank you, Trustee Duncan. Uh, Mr. Shortreed, over to you. Yeah, thank you for your compliments and um, for your question. Yes, everything placed on our library websites is available. It's um, continually shared with our school staff so they're aware of the new changes. Um, there's presentation packups that are on it. On the front page of eLibrary, for instance, there's a how to use this library website video. That's just a simple five minute walkthrough of where things are. Um, there's a section of digital library, it's called, that um, goes down into different podcasts that are recommended and nonfiction and magazine, digital magazines. And everything that you see on the websites on all levels are available to everyone. Um, so it is public facing. And if there's any a point where there's a district paid for subscription, um, and if you're trying to access it outside of our school network, so at home, then under staff info or student info, depending on who you are, you can get passwords to access those resources. And so on those pages, they what we found most effective is a tagline on that if you're a student from any school to reach out to your teacher librarian if you don't have the password for that page. And that seems to be the quickest way for students and staff to find it. Um, and because we can't share um, things like EBSCO and you know, Gale books and some of the bigger search engines, we can't share them publicly. So, but just to reiterate, when you're on school property and you're on school network, everything works while you're there without password. It's only when you're off site. Um, and so that's why we had to put one layer of, of password in there. Thank you, Mr. Shortreed. Um, Trustee Duncan, I think you have a follow up. So and then uh, Trustee Ferris will be next. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just actually had another question that's really useful information. I know a lot of kids who will be <laughs> happy to hear that uh, around the password and so on. Um, so the other question I had was around maker spaces. And um, 
if you could uh, provide us a little bit more information about how they're implemented. So I know from personal experience uh, that when my own child's um, a school librarian uh, brought in a maker space at the elementary level, um, it was very exciting. All the kids and the teaching staff were excited to have this introduced um, to the school library and it was on a trolley and the items on the trolley uh, were constantly changing and evolving. Um, but one of the questions I had was around how that's implemented. So how are those resources shared and used by not just the teacher librarian necessarily, but by teaching staff uh, throughout the school? Again, it'd be great to have a, a view of elementary, middle and high school. Thanks. Thank you, Trustee Duncan. Mr. Shortreed, uh, I'll let you respond. Thank you, Ryan, Chair. Um, I think there's a spectrum uh, across our school district of understanding of what maker space is. Um, it's part of the planning of any learning resource that's new to a school is equipping the teacher librarian or a shared space with the understanding and the know-how of what's going on with it. And then the end game for those resources to be used in the classroom with the classroom teacher. So if that is the end game with it, we've seen at, at the starting level is maybe it's a specific room that needs to be signed out with a specific teacher. And as that culture evolves, every staff in the school starts to be more and more comfortable using those resources on their own. And then that's why it was important to have it cataloged in the library for sign out purposes, or lots of schools figured out to create it as a kit that they would take the whole kit because it was too hard to track things. So we're seeing lots more kits but at the starting spot, it was much more like the space you went to. Some schools created um, it out of the need for a prep time for the teacher, and they hired a makerspace teacher. And then as it evolved over into the general capacity of the staff, um, they, with, in collaboration with the teacher librarian, often and sometimes in the library space, they would be working. Um, but the end goal is to have all staff comfortable with those resources. And then at the middle level, Obviously, there's more exploratory and those trades sides of the th that maker spaces are um, in and those spaces as well with the woodshop teacher or the projects that are ongoing. Well, the most effective use of these maker materials is when it's infused and embedded in the curriculum and inside the classroom. So that is where we're trying to get these. Um, and that's where the most meaningful and authentic learning is happening with anything from blocks to tools to um, a coding kind of kit uh, in isolation, they can only do so much. It's really when they're in the classroom. Hope that answers some of your questions, Nicole. Yeah, thanks very much. It does. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shortreed. Very good questions, Trustee Duncan. Uh, Trustee Ferris, uh, over to you. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you, Dave, for your presentation. I thought uh, it was very, very interesting. Uh, it seems like only a few years ago, we were wondering uh, where libraries would go in a di digital age. And uh, what we're seeing, of course, uh, and with your help, is that librarians librarians are school leaders in more ways than, than ever, really. And, uh, and, and I think that's wonderful because uh, having somebody there who can coordinate uh, knowledge resources is uh, wonderful for teachers and students. Uh, I was very interested in this idea that you're going to do a digital scan of collections, uh, or no, sorry, a diversity scan is what I meant to say, of collections. Uh, I know for my own family, that will be uh, an important step. And I'm sure for many other students uh, to uh, see books and uh, information that reflects uh, their own uh, cultural background, I think is incredibly important. So thank you for, for uh, your presentation. Very good points, Trustee Ferris. Uh, Mr. Shortreed, I don't know if you had a, a follow-up uh, with, with what Trustee Ferris uh, said or if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, I just add, Tom, that that first um, comment you made around um, our teacher librarians being school leaders, I think you are right. And what I've seen is working with um, our staff is if you can inspire um, and encourage and support a teacher librarian, you're impacting the whole school community. It's very different than um, one classroom teacher that may be on fire and may be excited about something, but there's not the same engine that a teacher librarian has in a shared space in a shared role. And especially when you're working with that to yell and you're, you're seeing that they're valuing that every learner in the school is they're engaged with. And that means staff and students. So just to reiterate your point, Tom, that's, 
that's um, that's why we're working with them in, in such key and strategic ways. Thank you. Wonderful. That's great. Thanks for that nuance. Um, uh, Andy, I just wanted to see if we had any questions in chat before I just checked in with folks. Um, no. No questions currently. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Andy. Uh, any questions from trustees or stakeholders in the group on our presentation? Going once, going twice. Alrighty. Well, uh, Mr. Shorty, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, your team is doing amazing work. Uh, and certainly, I think as Trustee Duncan said, during uh, COVID challenges, um, it's even more important. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me tonight for the continued conversations. Excellent. Okay, I uh, will now uh, go to the next section of new business, uh, which is a motion from uh, Trustee Rob Painter uh, on graduation activities. Uh, Trustee Painter, um, I'm gonna have you read the motion uh, and then we'll get a mover and then you can motivate uh, if you're okay with that process. Uh, that the Board of Education of School District Number 61, Greater Victoria, direct their superintendent to identify any planning requirements and procedures for graduation related activities and events with recognition to current provincial COVID-19 public health restrictions and district policies. Thank you. Can I have a mover for the motion? Trustee McNally, thank you very much. Trustee Painter, over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, it's quite a straightforward uh, situation, or at least I hope it is. Um, it's not so much that I was trying to uh, provoke anything significant, uh, just wanted to have a placeholder so that we could uh, discuss this matter, just clarify uh, what our, our various uh, grad committees need to do to uh, get the thumbs up from uh, the school district and to ensure that they're doing everything that they need to do to uh, have a safe and successful uh, grad event. Uh, there seems to be a bit of confusion right now about whether or not uh, uh, schools are expected to do basically all the same thing or uh, what range of opportunities are open to them. So just trying to get some clarity for them so that they could move forward with their uh, planning. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Painter. And, and I think your, your questions and, and thoughts are probably reflected in, in others around the table. Um, before I open up to the floor uh, for debate, I wanted to see if staff had any uh, input on this. Uh, Superintendent Green. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would I'd like to ask Colin, I know that you've been working with our secondary um, principals significantly and talking about grad, especially within all the COVID guidelines and um, restrictions. Can you please provide an update for Trustee Painter? It's certainly, I'll be happy to do that. So the, the topic of uh, the graduation has been discussed amongst secondary administrators since the, the turn of this uh, calendar year. And I think uh, unfortunately it became very clear relatively early in 2021 that that uh, customary ceremony that has held at UVic unfortunately would not be able to go ahead again this year as it as last year and schools have been in the process of uh, adjusting to that uh, new reality and so uh, each of the secondary schools have their grad committees so manned and uh, formed by grade 12 students at the school and then parallel to that um, there's usually through the school's PAC organizations, uh, parent involvement and input in, into what graduation activities might look like. And so uh, through those discussions, it looks like uh, two models seem to be coming to the forefront. And uh, again, this is a challenge for schools in terms of trying to balance the competing wishes of being able to involve family and friends, but also wanting the activity to be a group activity for the students and because of um, the health and safety regulations and restrictions are in place uh, at this point I say that's proven very challenging for the schools so in part I think the decisions that have been arrived at uh, reflect the wishes of those grad committees to some degree and uh, other effects the actual physical locations of the school 
so that the two models that are look like they're going to be coming forward are in place. As of one is a, a drive-through type event, uh, like a car parade where families will drive up to uh, uh, an area of the school where there's easy access. Uh, the student would exit the car, uh, cross a stage that would have been assembled outside, uh, have their photo taken, receive a graduation certificate or pick up their graduation certificate and then move back into the vehicle. Of course, the, the drawback of that is although our families can witness that, uh, it's not possible for each of the students then to be there with a group of friends. And so the alternative model that's developing is one where uh, through each of the learning cohorts, small groups are, are able to enjoy a graduation ceremony of sorts within the school setting. But of course, because of uh, the health and safety orders around the K to 12 uh, COVID settings, uh, it doesn't allow families to view that directly. And in those situations, schools are looking to uh, stream those events online so that families get to participate in that manner. Uh, of course, the other detail that uh, schools are looking at right now is the order from the provincial health officer for gatherings and events. And of course, at the moment, we're unable to do what we were last year and have uh, events of up to 50 people. Uh, and so I think some of the uncertainty about moving forward is that hope that perhaps after the May long weekend, schools will be given some license to, uh, to engage in activities that can in, uh, involve a larger number of students or uh, uh, friends and family as well. So uh, I think uh, two models coming forward and uh, there is some possibility for a shift if there is um, a kind of opening up of uh, allowable behavior but we're certainly trying, making sure that everything that we do is compliant with those orders. Thank you, Colin. Can I confirm with you that as our health um, orders do any shifting or changing, that you continue to meet with the secondary principals on all of their planning to ensure that they are within all the COVID management and restrictions? Yep. We've been discussing graduation on a, a monthly basis, and so uh, our most recent plans are based on the orders or the updated orders that were released just after spring break. And so we are, we are meeting again in about 10 days. Wonderful. So Trustee Painter, I hope this will help you with your motion on what you were looking for. Thank you, Superintendent Green and Associate Superintendent Roberts, certainly on uh, that very fulsome work that you and uh, the secondary principals uh, and teams are doing. It's no doubt a heady task. So uh, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to uh, trustee Rob Painter and then uh, VC PAC uh, Christine Payne. Uh, trustee Rob Painter, uh, go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. I, I do appreciate that clarification. It helps a lot. Uh, at this point in time, is uh, does the district have a role in authorizing these or is it that currently uh, you know, conversations between uh, the associate, superintendent, uh, associate superintendent and school principals with the principals providing sign off. Just curious about the mechanism. Uh, superintendent Green or Associate Superintendent Roberts. Colin, do you want to explain your process, please? Yeah, I'll be glad to. So, as I said, we've been discussing what might be permissible at each of our monthly meetings. And at this point, uh, principals have already entered into a database uh, their draft plans for uh, those, those activities. Um, obviously, some of the items are somewhat open to interpretation or uh, need several re-readings before we are clear. Um, where there is um, any doubt after this discussion between myself and the school-based staff, um, we refer those items to our, our district pandemic response team so that we're able to, to gather the feedback and viewpoints of, a, of the different experts. And if necessary, we can always reach out to our school medical health officer for their review. And so uh, like, as we get closer to the time, if we have any questions about whether we think um, an item is compliant or not, uh, we'll certainly be involved in that school medical health officer. Thank you, Associate Superintendent Roberts. Uh, VC PAC, Christine Payne, uh, go ahead. Right, thank you. Um, 
we are, you know, happy to hear that you've got some plans for all high schools across the district. That makes us uh, really happy. I'm just considering, we're just considering the, the lower grades. So particularly the K to, to five gr groups, if they, um, if they have, if you, if you could explain maybe planning and procedures that you may have in place for those group, that group of learners. Um, and we are, you know, supportive of this in, in the fact that, you know, this is a great, they, these are often significant events, major events in, in students' lives as they go through the years. And they're in this, at this time, they're great social, emotional, um, improve, they improve uh, benefits social, students socially, emotionally, as well as they are, um, provide a touchstone to the community through the parents and caregivers of the students. And so they help with con con uh, community connect connectivity, which is so needed uh, right now. So we applaud this. And just if you could uh, maybe give us some, some uh, information on the planning procedures for the K to, K to five group learners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Payne. Uh, Superintendent Green. So I'm, um... Just ask for a little bit of clarification when you're talking about planning procedures for K to five. I know that um, Trustee Painter's question was about the actual grad ceremony planning. So was there something in particular that you were curious about in K to five that I can be a little bit more specific about? Uh, well, in his motion, it says uh, graduation related activities. So when I think of graduation related activities, I think of you know K to one, I think of um, you know ceremonies at the end of the each year for kids in and then the, K, the five to six also grad or the grade, grade five grad. So the, I'm thinking of not just the high school grads. Thank you for that. That helps me a lot. Uh, so as you are aware, we are continually get the um, COVID updates about who can be in the same space at the same time and all of the related celebrations, etc. cetera, um, any time of um, planning together are underneath all of those um, guidelines and restrictions. Right now, of course, we um, are, are in a different scenario. We're hoping that we can get some broadening of some of these parameters, but a usual ceremony that we may have had um, in previous years certainly wouldn't look the same. So um, I don't have any particulars from any of the K to one that you're talking about or grade five, um, but I know that uh, Deb works with the elementary principals and vice principals and is constantly reviewing what the COVID guidelines tell us about gatherings, where they are, being outside, space in between, wearing masks, um, and planning would all be in line with all of those guidelines, Christine. Thank you, Superintendent Green. Uh, uh, Ms. Payne, go ahead. Oh, you're uh, on mute still, uh, Christine, sorry. Thank you. And just there a quick follow-up. I'm just. Uh, I understand about the COVID um, requirements. I'm more. Um, cons uh, more thinking about along the lines of a ceremony, an indoor ceremony or an outdoor ceremony that's uh, broadcast live for for the learners to to uh, participate in from home. Um, and maybe an. Uh, yeah. And I'm not just. I'm. Not, I'm also thinking about other other ceremonies that may be needed for um, not just K to K uh, K graduation, but you know, bringing back a ceremony to mark the end of the, of the year, that sort of thing. And maybe this is already happening. I just don't know. Thank you so much. Well, it's a very it's good question. Time. I can tell you about Remembrance Day that um, a lot of our schools went to um, remote um, experiences, uh, able to have sing kids singing in distances and, and film them so parents could see them. So yes, there's definitely some planning going on that, that can be viewed as a video, keeping within the guidelines, students presenting, um, having performances or being recognized. So yes, those things are going on in schools. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent Green. Uh, any further comments, questions, or discussion? Uh, we do have a motion on the floor still. Um, so wondering if, uh, yes, Trustee Ferris, please. Thank you. Um, it, it's not clear to me what it is that we're asking for. I, I mean, we've had some clarification about what's happening and how it happens. And I'm just wondering what more information the motion is going to bring. Uh, so if you could just clarify. Certainly Trustee Ferris, Trustee Rob Painter. I uh, don't know if you have anything to add. 
Uh, no, I think it's a fair question. Um, I honestly have, have received the, the information I need. My motion was simply there to uh, fit the criteria of our meetings rather than to uh, seek any specific outcome. So uh, I'm, you know, I, I see Trustee McNally's hand up, but uh, depending on the will of the, uh, well, I can't really withdraw it. I'm not part of the committee, but it wouldn't hurt me if it did. Well, and and yes, uh, and I think Trustee McNally is going to try to jump in on this uh, one for us. So Trustee McNally, go ahead. Yes, with the uh, consent of the meeting um, on behalf of uh, Trustee Painter as the mover of the motion, I'll withdraw. Yeah, and uh, if we have unanimous consent of the committee, uh, just please show your hands to withdraw the motion. Looks like we are um, all good to go. Uh, Trustee Waters, sorry, just uh, seeing if you were uh, in agreement to withdraw. Yeah, good, excellent. Okay, so we have unanimous consent. The motion is withdrawn. Uh, thank you for the discussion and the input uh, from staff and uh, questions from BCPAC as well. Um, we have no notices of motion and no general announcements. Uh, so we will now go to adjournment. Can I have a motion to adjourn, please? Moved by Trustee Duncan, all in favor? And none opposed. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, staff, our presenters, uh, and everyone for a wonderful meeting tonight. And we will see everybody around the bend very shortly. Have a good evening. Thank you very much.